So let's maybe get back to a couple of questions. Yeah. Like I said, there were you one know, or two um, from Peggy, and I think it's more on a light-hearted note, um, asking if elephants ever get hiccups. I didn't say ever. I've never noticed it, but I'm sure it does happen. I know baboons can get hiccups. I've seen baboons with that. Um, and I don't actually know enough about the, 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 the physical aspect of what causes hiccups, how it makes the diaphragm react and so on. So, um, uh, but I would guess maybe. I mean, I've seen it with predators. I've seen it with, uh, I can't remember, leopard or lion, one of the two, when they were very full. Uh, and I was asking about biltong, which is um, something, that, again, that if you uh, come on safari, Aja, you'll probably taste it. It's beef jerky, essentially. And just asking what kind of venison meat gets used for it. Uh, kudu is a typical one, beef also, but also other kinds of venison. In South Africa, people do eat venison quite a bit, and it's a bit of a strange concept, maybe relative to game drives, but um, interesting thing to think about. If more people ate venison, maybe there'd be more animals around sure. living, in, living in the wild. <coughs> Absolutely, and um, I mean, venison, and uh, obviously we lose the chance to have wild game over there so it's um it is uh, there is definitely a, a, a market out there and uh, yeah south africans uh, biltong is definitely a very favorite uh, luxury or uh, delicacy for a lot of south africans it's um, definitely a strong part of our culture out here uh, i'm sure a lot of you will get the opportunity to try that one day yeah and it's a good one <laughs> i teeth in it as a youngster no, it's, um, it's one of those things I was myself if you once i start eating it uh, <laughs> the packet's gone and i'm usually a little bit ill after something worth trying it Salt and meat, essentially, it's something we've craved for a long time. That deep voice you can maybe hear in the background is million. He's just coming past the back. Um, Which is a good um, uh, topic, uh, talking about background noises. I believe yeah. there was a question on background <laughs> noises. <laughs> yeah, It's funny how sometimes being live can actually lead you, never mind having to figure it out yourself. Um, like I've said before, just quickly before we go into that, I, I'm, I, feel a little bit, I feel a bit strange here still because I feel like I just want to chat, same as on the vehicle, and I'm sure we'll, we'll fully get to that stage. Um, feels like we spoke to Graham earlier, I think chatting would become something that's quite possible down the line more and more so. But uh, background noises, apart from me rambling on sometimes, is uh, about Gary Wartol, a question that came through from um, Sandy asking, and I'm sure many of you have wondered about the same thing. Uh, there's quite often various noises you can hear from the sound, apart from some of the funny sounds we had. We had a bit of sound issues, uh, starting from my hinos chewing in the cable to uh, various other things. But um, quite often you can hear, or not often, occasionally you can hear dogs barking. There are around, apart from the wild dogs and the jackals. Um, but sometimes there's maybe something that upsets them, maybe something running around the garden or something like that, and uh, that's what you're hearing. Also, the drums occasion, I have noticed, uh, I remember a few days ago, a week or so ago, somewhere, there was a breeding herd as well as wonky at the same time down at the pan drinking water, and the dinner drums played, um, and the breeding herd sort of moved off slowly. Uh, wonky, of course, just ignored it. I, I think I might have even noticed his foot tapping a little bit. I mean, he's well used to everything. Um, and also send it sort of not there, but it really is. It's all part of us. You know, we're close enough to the water hole to, to be able to hear sounds from there and, and vice versa. So if you do hear some odd sounds, it's uh, nothing weird. It's just uh, the people that live around it as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is, a, which is a great thing really about the reserves out here. It's one thing that I've always admired is there is... Um, <clears throat> and uh, w we here at Wild Earth, our prime example is, um, like people, um, Peter says, there's people around, people living out here, and um, it's communities, uh, little families at the end of the extended family out uh, all over the world. Um, but um, <clears throat> you, um, yeah, we, we often do hear some strange noises uh, out in the bush. And speaking of strange noises, and I think I may have actually mentioned it before, um, I... I've normally stayed uh, in the room directly next to the final control center where all our um, broadcasting equipment is and a lot of our sound, well, all our sound equipment. And uh, many nights um, while I'm lying in my bed fast asleep uh, and the sound has been left up quite high, um, <laughs> the mic's there by the water hole and lets out an almighty cry which amplifies as it comes through the speakers and it sounds like he's standing right next to my bed while I'm half asleep. So it can always be quite exciting hearing that noise. <laughs> It's not a particularly, uh, well, it is a, actually, there's a very pleasant way to wake up. Uh, it's not a bad way, except that, you know, you, there must be a split second where sort of the primal part of your brain just tells you that there's a hina calling next to your ear, <laughs> and that's not normal, you know, until you wake up enough yeah. to realize, okay, it's coming through a fiber optic line. Um, there's so many things I actually want to talk about that, that is not possible at the moment, but um, the community thing is, is a very real thing in terms of all of us living out here together, literally with you as well, spending a lot of time with us. And also with, with the animals around us. Now, there's a question that, that sort of to adds into that, which uh, I'll, we'll touch on when Matteo comes and joins us now. We'll, we'll sort of touch on that again as well. But uh, it's a question that came through from, uh, from Joe. 
um, asking about more specifically leopards in the Sabi sand and the level of habituation that's been achieved. Between, um, Joe gave a bit of history and so on as well. Um, I want to, Joe, if you don't mind, uh, not, not to go into the details of that specific question too much, but it immediately made me think of uh, something that we've dealt with to a large extent over the last week or two, is that um, it, it's the level of habituation of animals to us, in other words, how used they get to vehicles, Game drive vehicles in the market, I'm sure you've seen it's something I've noticed even more as I've really been looking at behavior. They react slightly different to the wild earth vehicle because it is slightly different. It looks a bit different. It's got uh, noise the whole time. And animals in the beginning ignored it a little bit because it was strange, but they've seen it around long enough now that they now come and investigate it to the point where Wonky the other night was so close, I literally could have reached out like that and, and grabbed his tusk and he was just having a look at us. So um, my point I'm trying to get to Joe and, 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 and everyone else as well is that you can think of it from two ways. The one is that the animals are getting habituated to us and how they're coping with it, which in my experience, Marco, and, 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 and give your side of it just now, they deal with fine. Animals can learn to, to have always, over a long period of time, learned to interact and coexist with other species. What gets interesting, and this is what had me thinking earlier, is how we cope with that. As humans, how do we cope with the fact that animals are getting used to us as well? In other words, do we now go and say, oh no, this leopard is getting too close to camp, we've got to make something or do something because now it's threatening me, or I'm feeling uncomfortable because of this elephant being comfortable with me, and I'm going to cope with that now. And, and that's something that, uh, Joe, the question, what it sparks in my mind is very interesting, and I'll, I'll think about it more, is, uh, is how do we as humans cope with animals accepting us in the environment? Um, yeah, no, that's actually a, a very interesting way of looking at it, Peter, I must say. I've never uh, tackled it that way. It's uh, normally talking about animals being habituated, so the general way of um, seeing it is how they feel with our presence. But, um, no, it's a very good point. How do we feel with their presence being close? And um, working as guides um, um, for for Peter and myself, um, and I'm sure you're them, especially individuals, and um, you, you learn a lot about the characteristics of these uh, individuals. But for a person who's maybe never been on the back of a vehicle and uh, all of a sudden you do have a five and a half ton elephant walking five meters away, it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's something that we're not uh, particularly used to. But that elephant is habituated to our, to our presence. Um, where do we become habituated to, to his presence? Um, I can actually remember a situation that I'd been in, Peter, with a leopard that had become so habituated mm. a, a means of hunting. As soon as a vehicle approached her, um, she would actually start walking right next to the tires. And if you turn the vehicle off, she stopped next to the tire. If you started driving again, she would carry on walking. You actually couldn't get away from her. Uh, she was so well... <laughs> Yeah, she just she she was so familiar with the vehicle mm. that she knew exactly what it uh, what it did and that it wasn't a threat. It was a neutral presence. It's um, obviously when it moved, it made a loud sound, which helped camouflage her activity mm. as well. So it's um, it's amazing how animals actually do adapt um, and become comfortable and confident with the vehicles being around. No, it's it's, it's a direct commensalistic I think mm. is the word or commensalism relationship. The same as the drongo learns to follow the elephant, and the elephant yeah. doesn't really mind if the drongo is there, yeah, yeah. and the drongo benefits from it. That leopard has learned that these things are part of our environment, and trust me, four by four vehicles going around following animals in this particular part of the world is very much part of the environment. The mm. same, if not more so, than some of the animals. So yeah. it, it, it's, it's maybe strange to go the rest of other animals. The fact that we figured out a few things technology-wise is fantastic. That's why we can talk to you around the fire from, uh, from uh, South Africa, Jumaya. But we must stop thinking of us as like the outsiders that we have to continuously be aware of how do we influence things in, in, in a natural environment. Obviously, there's a lot of other ways that we should think about how we influence things. But um, it's, it's not necessarily that wrong for animals to get habituated to us uh, as well, uh, rather than just accepting and allowing us there, but to say, well, these things are part of our environment. Attacked, so animals learn to leave us alone. But you know, now there's new generations, and as we've learned as a species amongst ourselves that we can get on in various ways, Surely there's potential for us to learn that about animals as well, to learn that maybe we can coexist more. You know, maybe um, there are other ways of, of, of living, and, and, and that can be learned through behavior. Mm. A mother teaches a child how they, how they live, whether it's a human or an animal, and, and the potential maybe exists for it down the line that a lot more animals can live uh, in coexistence with humans rather than in competition like they have.